Amen. Thank you, Brother and Sister Quails. Amen. It's a wonderful song. I was introduced to that song many years ago as a little boy in a camp meeting in the country. Brother Raymond Rice sang that. And uh, only he was on the other end of the scale. And uh, I enjoy hearing people who can sing high, too. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, it's been a good day today, and to thank God for, the, for his presence. Amen. I enjoyed the, uh, the lesson this morning very much. I just wish that I could have had that information um, back when I was in school, and they were presenting the question of the gap theory. Of course, if I had that information, I would have no idea how to communicate that information. <laughs> but I did, I did appreciate it very much. About halfway through, I suppose, uh, it began to dawn on me. I'm slow. It began to dawn on me where we were going with that. And uh, when we got to the end... That's something that really disturbs me, that we are, we are so busy trying. I, I'm not talking about the world now, but so busy in the church. We are just, we're just so busy trying to fit God's doctrine into the world's teaching. And that's very troubling. And it seems like some are doing it as a whole, as was brought out this morning. And it seems like others are doing it just one principle at a time. And uh, I don't know, trying to squeeze God's word into our lives rather than squeeze our lives into God's word, if that makes sense. See, I can't communicate like he can. Somebody said to me, they said, now, Brother Spangler, do you believe in the gap theory? Absolutely, I have no choice. I see it every morning when I brush my teeth. And I'm sorry if you disagree with me from there on out, but that's about as far as it goes for me. There's enough for me. I'm so simple. There's enough for me in God's Word that's there to try to figure out what isn't. And, uh, but I would take no issue. I had somebody come to me today and say they believed in the gap theory. And I just thought, well, that's great and wonderful, but don't go into it now. I've got to go eat. I've enjoyed those lessons. In fact, the other day, he gave us a little, he gave us a little science test. You remember, he asked us the question about uh, what, what makes a chemical poison, something to that effect. And my wife whispered in my ear, ear the correct answer. And uh, when he said, Did you get, if you got it right, you get 100% on your test, my wife was so happy. She said, Honey, that's the first time I've ever got 100% on a science test. But I've enjoyed it. And then uh, we slipped out a little bit this afternoon just to be over in the children's service. We went straight there and came straight back and appreciate Brother Stephen's ministry. And we even slipped over here to the other building, the youth tabernacle, over here and got just a few minutes of our youth teacher and appreciated it very, very much. God is good to us, isn't he? And God's still trying to help us. Amen. I want you to turn to two portions of Scripture tonight. Let's stand together, Ephesians 4. So good to see some good friends of mine that slipped in somewhere along the line. Brother and Sister Steve and Lizzie Robertson. It's good to see them here tonight. And many others, but I'm just glad to see them. Ephesians chapter 4. I want to read verses 1 through 6 and jump down to verse number 11 through 14a. Verses 1 through 6 and then down to verse number 11. And we'll read down to the beginning part or so there in verse number 14. Ephesians chapter 4, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. 
one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Verse number 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. And I would like you to turn to 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 16. I'd like to talk to you about this subject tonight, an appeal for a holy life. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober in hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. But ask Brother Cope if he would to ask a blessing on our thoughts tonight. Man, you may be seated. I would just ask if, if you are sanctified holy and know that you are, that you would perhaps breathe a prayer or so through the service. If you don't know that you're sanctified holy, I would just ask you to keep your heart and mind open as we share what I feel the Lord has placed upon our heart. I want to notice just a couple things quickly. I want to notice that word conversation that we found there in verse number 15. It's talking about not, not our speech necessarily. It's talking about our behavior. Uh, not talk necessarily, but walk, which would include our talk. I want you to notice that when we read there from Ephesians that the leaders of the church are here specifically given a job to thoroughly instruct the believers to be sure that they are justified and sanctified and sealed unto him. We need to remember, church, that holiness is a life to be lived. It's not just a creed to hold on to. It's how God created you to be. It's how he created you to live. It's a beautiful life. Although some people by their profession of holiness versus their unholy lifestyle, they have tarnished the perception of holiness among many. I'm sure that many of us could share various illustrations concerning this. There are many out here. In fact, I still feel very much like they told us back when I was in school that, that the the world today is extremely churchy. But that the church today is extremely worldly. And yet it seems like often wherever you go anymore in religious circles, it, it, seems, like, um, it seems like many people profess it. My focus tonight would be, do we live it? I remember having on a particular occasion, I remember having an individual come that uh, felt like uh, he experienced holiness of heart. He happened to be a board member in one of the churches that I was pastoring. I remember that 
different problems were happening and different things were happening, mainly concerning new converts in the church. I just want to caution you to remember from whence you were dug. Remember how long it took you to walk in the light. Remember how long it took you to, to uh, change and line up to all the issues and all the areas that God, through His Word or through the Holy Spirit or through the full initiative of preaching, spoke to you about and that time frame that it took you. But I can remember in this particular case, this, this uh, uh, fellow... Uh, felt like he was sanctified holy and that literally by his own, his own proclamation that no one in the church was, no one else in the church was. And I can remember one particular time my wife and I and my daughter Marie, for whatever reason, we were in the Pelican House. Now that's a coffee shop. And we were in the, we were in the coffee shop and, and um, we might have been there to get a cup of coffee. I don't know, that wouldn't be typical of us. We drink coffee, we drink a lot of coffee, but we like Folgers at home. It's cheaper. But we were in there, and then one part of that coffee shop was, an, was a furniture store, all Amish-made uh, furniture. And this particular day, we were in there, and for whatever reason, I was over, and I was walking around looking at some of the furniture that was there. I admire uh, furniture and craftsmanship, and I was walking around admiring that when I happened to notice through the big plate glass front of the store, I happened to notice that down walked one of my board members from my church. And that he looked through the glass and that he saw me in there and he proceeded to come in. He's welcome. And he came in and he began to talk to me about all of the problems about everyone else. He began to get quite vocal and and uh, got right into my face until my, my wife and my daughter were a little bit embarrassed as they, you know, I think anybody would be. Here were people in the store that owned the store and other customers in the store that were observing. And they were watching. They were inquisitive. I'm inquisitive when I see people who profess holiness act like some of the things they act like. And they were inquisitive and they were, uh, they were sort of standing around and watching. But this conversation, one-sided though it was, it proceeded for 30 minutes, 45 minutes, an hour. Until the store finally closed. All the other patrons left. My wife and daughter went out and climbed into our truck. I was still standing there and I was still being chewed out good and proper. And I watched as the, as the people that owned the store were working around behind him with their vacuum sweeper, trying to clean up. I was thankful for the noise of the vacuum sweeper. And I said to him several times, I said, we, we need to be going. It, we can talk about this later, but we, we need to be going. And, and uh, they're, they're closing the store. I'm not finished with you yet. We need to be going then for that reason. And I remember I finally got him. I mean, I, I'm talking a long period of time. Finally got him to the door. And I got him to the, to the door, but he wouldn't go out the door. They had already locked the door, and they were standing right there behind me waiting to unlock the door to let us out. The holiness preacher and his holiness board member. And, and finally, I convinced him, look, we need to be going. We need to get out. Let's go out on the street. And so finally, he agreed. We went outside, and then we stood outside the door, and she locked the door behind us, and we stood out there, and he proceeded. And I finally thought, you know, this isn't very productive. We're trying to reach people in this town. We minister in town. It wasn't the town where the church was, but it was very close by. And uh, I thought, I, I just need to be going. So I started walking down the sidewalk. You can say, Brother Spangler, was that sort of rude? It was very rude. I started walking down the sidewalk. And he was right here alongside, trying to, trying to get my attention, trying to pull me back. And I would say, you know, I really need to be going. And, and uh, on down the sidewalk I went and, and out, down off of the curb and out into the street. To, and I was walking down the street and he was right here beside me. Going the whole time. Finger up and pointed and red faced and shaking his fist. Don't you love holiness? 
And I can remember as I went to my vehicle, and there was my wife and my daughter with their heads bowed. But the window was open. They were listening. And I go up to the side of the vehicle, and I, I tell them, I say, I really need to be going. We're standing now right out in the lane of traffic. And I'm trying to get in my vehicle. Cars are going by. And they're saying, wow, look, another holiness meeting. And I finally get the door open and I get in my vehicle and I say, I'm sorry. And I call him by name and I say, I really need to be going. I, I, I just don't think this, our conversation is helping anything at all. And I tried to be as kind as I could. And I put the key in the ignition and turned the key to power the windows. And, and I started putting my window up. That's very rude. And I put my window up and as my window's going up, his fingers are in my window. And he's trying to hold down on the glass. And his mouth is up to the window and he's yelling in my vehicle. And my wife is crying and my daughter's crying. And my wife's saying, honey, let's go, let's go. <laughs> what would you say, wife? And so I said, you know, I said, I'm very sorry to do this. I said, I'm going to put my window up. And I said, I'm going to, I'm going to, I told him, I just wanted to let him know ahead. I'm, I'm going to pull the gear shifter down into drive, and I'm, I'm going to pull away. Honey, dial 911. <laughs> no, I didn't say that. Didn't even think it till just now. <laughs> but I, I pulled it down in the gear, and I said, I'm leaving. My window's this far down. The little visor's over the top, and, and he kind of gets his finger, and as I pull away, he's yelling at me as we go down the street. We're pulling away in slow motion. I didn't squall the tires. We pull away, and, and, and as I'm going down the street, he's yelling and carrying on. Aren't you thankful for holiness? Aren't you glad it can change you? I'm glad God can do something in our hearts, folks. I'm glad he can do something in our hearts. I want you to know tonight... It's not how we look. Sorry. It's not how we look, although it will affect the way we appear. It's not what we do or what we don't do, but it will greatly impact our doings and our ref refrainings. Holiness is not about being perfect or angelic in every way, but it's about being perfect in love. I thought about using Brother Cope for an example tonight. Brother Cope has white hair, pretty white hair. He's a good man. He's a gracious man. He has a pretty smile, too. <laughs> and he's my favorite. I've told him, and I've told many of others, he's my favorite preacher on this subject. He come and preached at our camp, I think, every single message on holiness, and I loved it. He was teamed up one time with Brother Marshall Smart. Brother Marshall Smart preached every sermon on the first work of grace. Guess what Brother Cope preached on? And it worked. He has this pretty white hair, but if you'll look very closely, he does not have white wings. I appreciate him very much in his life very much. He's a man of God. We have to realize that it doesn't make us angelic. I'm not worried about him getting confused there. I'm worried about some others getting confused there. We're still human. Lest we be mistaken... It is about being separated from all else unto God Almighty. One of the greatest calamities of our church today is that people try to live a holy life without first experiencing a holy heart. Or else they claim to live a holy life without possessing a holy heart. And people at the Pelican House, they know the profession but they don't see the possession. And it turns them off. And it ought to turn them off. It turns me off. I 
I don't know who that was back there, little fella. But you're on my team, and I appreciate it. Would you understand this, and, and don't be too hard on me. I told my dad even today, God's transformed my dad, changed my dad years ago. He's a wonderful man. I, I would appreciate prayer for him. He's, there's a very serious situation that's just happen, happening in his physical condition. We'll find out more when we get home. But I told dad today, I said, dad... I think you'll understand what I mean. But I said, Dad, really in my heart, I'm almost glad. I'm almost glad that Ronnie, my oldest brother, I'm almost glad that, that he's not been around the Holiness Church very much. Now, my brother Ronnie has never touched a drop of alcohol, never touched a cigarette to his lips, lives a good life, has three precious children, very supportive of us in our ministry, doesn't profess to be a Christian whatsoever. His wife is a Catholic, Wendy, wonderful sister-in-law. When I said, Dad, I'm just, I'm almost thankful that Ronnie has not been exposed to the holiness church in the sense that he doesn't have all of this baggage from observing all of this stuff. All of our problems and all of our squabbles and all of our issues and all of our wrangling. Back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. I said, Dad, I believe, I believe God's dealing with Ronnie. Little things that he says. I believe that God, I've talked with him several times this week. I believe God's dealing with him. But I've watched a few people who got bitter over things they saw under the name of holiness in the church leave the church. And I'm not condoning that they left the church, but I certainly am not condoning some of the attitudes and some of the actions that happen through the lives of professing Holiness people, professing holiness people. I believe that God wants to help us to be genuine folks. We must be holy on the inside to be holy on the outside or else we become a tinkling brass and a sounding cymbal. Holy, H-O-L-Y, has the same root as holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, it means complete. A person is not complete in spiritual stature if all of his mind and heart and soul and strength are not completely given to God. Not in part, but the whole. Everything given to God. For our example of holiness, we look not to earthly peers, they're disappointing sometimes. Nor to spiritual saints. Nor to past traditions or current customs. It's not our outward standards nor our inward professions. Neither do we look to church leaders nor church discipline. Instead, we look to Christ. 1 Peter 2, 21 through 25, For even here too were ye called... Because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously, who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Full deliverance is what he wants us to have. Deliverance from the guilt of sin, deliverance from the power of sin. 
Literally, he wants to deliver us, to, to have us to be freed from the dominion of it, and he wants us to have our lives reformed into a holiness life, changed into a holiness life. It's what God desires. It isn't just something we talk about or preach about. We have to live it. It's a life to be lived. What was his example? There's four things that he listed for us. No, I'm sorry. They're not the four points of my message. But I want to give them to you quickly. First of all, he did no sin. How much is no sin? He did no sin. That's just for starters. Secondly, neither was guile found in his mouth. If God would allow me, and God continues to lead this meeting as I feel and been sensing that it's been, that he has been, I would like to preach on the tongue. If you don't like that, don't come that night. What night, Brother Spangler? The night you are here. Because we all need to hear it. Not because it's my message, but because it's God's word. Neither was guile found in his mouth. Gossip. I probably shouldn't tell you this, but... Do you know that just, that just makes me stiff as soon as I hear those words? I probably shouldn't say this, Brother Spangler. I don't think I'm supposed to say anything here, but... Don't you wish we were on point two and had two more to go and we'd be done? When he was reviled, he reviled not again. When he suffered, he, suff he threatened not. Instead, he committed the situation back to the Father. It's in the imperative act of tense, which means that he just kept giving it back to the Father. Have you ever been persecuted? If you serve God with all your heart, I reckon to say you probably have to some measure. Do you retaliate? Not if God lives in your heart in its fullest. But it's okay to take it to Him. It's all right to take it to Him and say, God, I don't know why this has to be. I don't know why this has to come up. I don't know why this has to happen. But I bring it to you. And I ask for your grace and your strength. He is our example, Jesus. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. That sounds to me like there's a little bit of work involved, a little bit of reproach involved. If you're going to serve God with all your heart, get used to the fact. There's going to be a little bit of reproach. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also to walk even as he walked. It's quiet in here. It's almost as quiet as it was earlier this morning. It's very quiet in here. I trust you're listening or praying. We are not holy because we are part of some congregation or conference or connection. Not because of our upbringing or our heritage or some great family name. We are not holy because so-and-so will use us and so-and-so won't. Because uh, we have a computer or we don't have a computer. Or whatever else it is. We are not holy because we take a particular stand on an issue or a piece of technology. We can only be holy as we become all that our Heavenly Father desires us to be. Through the aid and the example of Jesus Christ and the indwelling of God's Holy Spirit. Some of you will never, never be able to come along the rest of the message because you got hung up somewhere. Let me just unhang you. I don't have it in my home. Sister Judy Williams said, 
The internet. The internet can be a very useful tool. But she went on to say the internet can also be a very dangerous toy. Come along if you want to, get off if you want to. But I'm telling you folks, when we get to where we judge one another, we're wrong. And when we get to where we judge one another for how we stand on a particular issue, we're doubly wrong. There is a tendency to totally disregard Paul's admonition to the Corinthians when he said, do, you, do ye look on things after the outward appearance? Hear me. Do ye look on things after the outward appearance? If any man trusts to himself that he is, that he is Christ, let him of himself think this again. For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. When our holiness is simply based upon how we measure up against one another, good or bad, we are only kidding ourselves. Many find comfort in the fact that someone else is a, of the persuasion is a little less spiritual. And so they take comfort for where they are. God help us. Preachers, your job, according to the writer that we read from tonight, is to encourage, encourage others to come along, to experience it, the fullness of Christ. Not to put them down if they don't measure up. I don't say this too much, but it just feels appropriate right now. That's good preaching, Brother Spangler. I said the other night, I don't even remember why I was talking. I think I referenced personal convictions. I said the other night about, I felt like God wants me to put my sleeves down to my wrist. But my dad, a retired union carpenter, he rolls his sleeves up, his cuffs up twice. His, his sleeves are here. I suppose it's from, I don't know where it's from, but that's what he does. God put a personal conviction on me because I was all tied to him. My blue Levi jeans, 501s. Some of you know what I'm talking about. I had stacks of them. I went to the store every paycheck and bought more of them. Every two weeks, I went to the store and bought two more pair. That's all I wore. And my pretty western shirts with my pearly looking buttons. Cheap plastic is all they were. My dad rolls his sleeves up. Never, never see him above his elbow. Why don't we just go on home now? If it's going to be that slow, it's going to be a long night. <laughs> he rolls his sleeves up twice. And he wears blue Levi jeans. But as I spoke to him today on the phone, and he began to tell me of something that he's reading right now in the scripture and taking it over to John Wesley, I, I have the same problem. I read Wesley too. I've been criticized for it. I've been criticized because I reference John Wesley too much. Would it be better if I reference you more often? My wife got tickled. My wife was looking through my notes and she said, dear, look at this. These, these all say, Wesley said, John Wesley said, I mean sermon after sermon after sermon. Wesley said this and Wesley said that. Well, maybe it's part in bread, I don't know, but 
Dad was reading some of John Wesley today and reading the scripture today and sharing with me on the phone and, and uh, talking to me a little bit about it. And, and I said to him before we went, I said, Dad, I said, I'm praying for you. He told me, he said, I'm praying for you while you're there. I said, Dad, I appreciate that very much. And I said, Dad, I want you to know I'm praying for you. All this other situation that's just now developing. I said, Dad, I'm praying for you. He said, Brian, I appreciate it. Let me tell you something, folks. He's a little different than I am. He's only about this tall. We have some similarities. He has the Spangler Gap. But let me tell you, I don't expect him to do it all my way. He doesn't expect me to do it all his way. We expect each other to do it God's way. And I'd call on him to pray for me over anything and confidence in his prayer. I'm just saying sometimes we get all tied up into dressing everybody up the way we think they should be. Now you all don't do that here, so you should say a big hearty amen. That's just exactly what I figured. But I love you. I think some of you might have been guilty there. Some of you would have swallowed your teeth had they been false. It isn't that we try to line them up to ourselves. Others would consider anyone who would not be almost clone-like to themselves to be practically heathen. That's right. Aren't you glad we're, all not, we're not all alike? Aren't you glad? Wave at me if you're glad you're not like me. Some of you started waving and you pulled your hand down quick. If you want to be like me, you're going to have to just face the fact you're going to be odd. We're not all alike, are we? We're all different. When I hear those morning Bible lessons... I think, where in the world do they get them? But I'm glad they got them. And I hear all, those, all that stuff. I can't process it. I thought I should be down here with notes, but I don't even know how to spell those words. <laughs> when he said something about tofu or whatever it was today, I thought that was some kind of food that didn't have meat in it. My wife's grandmother used to eat, but I think I've just pronounced it wrong. We're not all alike, are we? There's all types of us. Brother Cope, there's all kinds of us. You have to love him. You come back tomorrow and I might say more about that. That's your warning. And you make sure you show up tomorrow, Brother Cope. <laughs> they say there are four personality types. They told me I'm a bee. Brother, I don't even know what they mean by it. That's how thick this is. But this is a little thicker than yours too. They say there's four personality types. Four personality types. And that I'm a bee. I think they came to that conclusion because my name starts with B. And they tell us that and they preach it. Those, those, with, those of the intellectual side, they tell us it's four personality types. All of us fit into four, one of four categories. I would say baloney. <laughs> There's not four personality types. Who in the world came up with that? Four personality types? There's probably 4,000 or 40,000 or 4 million personality types. God didn't make any of us alike. We're all different. Look at the grains of sand on the seashore or the snowflakes that fall. Look at the stars. We're all different. One way or another. I'm thankful for that. Aren't you? Just pray that God would help us to remember something that Matthew Henry has to say. He says, There is room in Christ for many, and those who differ much from one another 
may yet be one in him. It would help, he said, to heal the differences that are among us if we would remember that how confident soever we may be that we belong to Christ, yet at the same time we must allow that those who differ from us may belong to Christ too or also, and therefore should be treated accordingly. We must not think that we are the people and that none belong to Christ but ourselves. 1 Peter 1, 15, 16 but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, be ye holy. May we realize once again that holiness, someone said, and I don't know the author, but has love for its essence, humility for its clothing, the good of others for its employment, and the honor of God as its end. And may we never forget that holiness is wrought by the Holy Spirit not because we have suffered, but rather because we have surrendered. I've been around those who feel like this work of grace could only come if they would afflict themselves in with some great suffering. Those who felt they could only claim the blessing as if their spiritual, when their spiritual leader would permit it or allow them to do so. And many of them went away without the second needed work of grace and have compromised the first work of grace because they were deceived into patterning their lives, their heart after man's thoughts and ideas. Today they're out of the church because they could never achieve the standard that the false teacher set before them that they were supposed to attain for a holy heart. While at the same time, I must remind you to be fair, this second definite work of grace goes far deeper than just a mere verbal profession. It's not necessarily about a simple second trip to the altar, nor the shedding of a few tears while hanging over a mourner's bench. It's far more than we talk about. It's how we actually walk because God totally totally transforms our heart and removes anything and everything that's unholy. I don't know how else to say this, but the truth is sadly, but surely we often attempt to scare people into seeking holiness and allow fear to become the motivator. I hope you'll stay with me. Fear and doubt are the two greatest enemies of preventing a heart from discovering holiness. Fear and doubt. And often it's the case that, that we try to pressure them. It won't work. I want to encourage them. I want people to get sanctified holy. I know what a wonderful change it will make in your life. But if you just do it because the preacher, it's not going to work. I believe that God's Holy Spirit is busy working among the saved. Whether we're at camp meeting or not. I believe God's Holy Spirit isn't, if you're truly saved, I believe that His Holy Spirit will be working in your life. Leading you, guiding you, directing you through the Word. Through preaching, yes, but through the Word. He'll guide you and direct you to a place where, where, where you come to, where you say, oh God, if that's what you want for me, that's what I want. You don't grow into it, but you grow to a place, you'll get to a place, you'll come to a place where all of a sudden there will have to be a definite, instantaneous miracle that takes place. And I believe with all of my heart, I've been criticized for this, but I believe with all of my heart, when it happens, you'll know it. And you'll know where it happened. I just don't see how it can happen and you not know it. I want to encourage people to take it by faith because that's how we take it. But I want them to take it by their faith, not my faith. Shallow seeking is often brought on by well-meaning people who shout out, if you're here tonight and professing to be saved and not sanctified, you ought to be the first ones at the altar. Maybe so, maybe not so. It's nice and quiet, at least you're listening. 
I know the scripture we read encourages us as God's ministers to do our best to preach it, to teach it, to, to invite them, to encourage them, to tell them why it's a necessity, to tell them it's God's requirement. But I also know that sometimes we're just interested in souls at the altar. And God help us. I was in a camp meeting one time when a preacher preached on holiness and gave the invitation and souls came to the altar. And I watched the preacher take out his pen and take out his little notebook and he counted the souls at the altar and he wrote them down and he folded his little notebook and he put it back in his pocket. Now that's all right. That's all right if you're, if you're trying to weigh yourself before the Lord to see if you're being effective. But I also watched that preacher, as soon as he got the notebook away, to slip off the platform and out the side door while the rest of the people were called in to pray with those that were seeking holiness. And that troubled me. I understand, and maybe they do around here, I understand that sometimes the question is asked, how many seekers have you had at your altars? I understand some of Wesley, what Wesley was doing. But I'm telling you, folks, if that's all that it's about, God help us, because it's about way more than that. We need God to, through His Holy Spirit, to move on hearts, to talk to hearts, to deal with hearts. Never. And I would say... Please don't be too hard on Brother Spangler. I don't know how you pastors are, but I, I resigned every Sunday night when I got done preaching, when I was pastoring. Every Sunday night I resigned on my way over to the, to the parsonage. Before I got in there, I was done. Pack the stuff, honey. I had three little children. They'd say, Dad, that was good. That was a good message, Dad. Thanks for the message. And then to try to cheer me up, my one son, I won't say which child it is for sure, but it's one of the boys. It's one of my sons. It's one of the boys. He would, he'd say, Dad, did you see so-and-so? I said, no, what? He said, Dad, they were doing this. And then he would do it. <laughs> Dad, did, did you see so-and-so? No, what was that? Oh, Dad, he said, you should have saw. Here they go. And, they, and he'd just, didn't he, honey? He'd mimic them all. Everybody in our church, he'd mimic them all. What'd you do, Brother Spangler? Did you discipline him? You kidding? I sat in my recliner and laughed and laughed my head off. I said, you're good. You're acting just like them. That's just exactly how they do it. You're right. And through God helping me and, and my children trying to encourage me a little bit, I stuck around, told my wife, unpack the dishes. We'll stay another week. But I know the devil, I know the devil takes little thoughts and little pieces and oftentimes he just drills at home with you and then he just keeps you on that all the rest of the night and everything else is hinged on that and you get nothing else out of it. So let me just say that perhaps in some cases this is true, that if they're not seeking holiness, they need to be. They need to be the first ones at the altar. Maybe sometimes that's true. I'll say that for you. You can say amen or just stay quiet like you are. It'd probably be best. But never let a man attempt to do the work of the blessed Holy Ghost on your behalf. Whether it be in the realm of conviction or consecration, this old world is full of impersonators and the church is by no means exempt from them. It may well take you more than a trip or two to the altar or a place of prayer. It may actually require you a meal or so or to seek an hour or a day or a week or I don't know. But I can tell you this, there are many examples of discouraged, disgruntled, deceived people who started out well, but they got sidetracked and disoriented because they started focusing in on what man wanted instead of what God wanted. They paid too much attention, too much heed to man's thoughts and ideas versus God's way, the holy way. Seek it with your whole heart. Surrender with your whole self. 
and experience it, you will. We know it is what God truly requires. We know it's what God truly desires. And we know it's what God truly does. I see it's late. I'm not through. Could you bear with me a little while? At the same time, please, please, if you heard what I just said, would you please listen here? At the same time, I know, I know many a good, sound preachers and people who have carefully, prayerfully endeavored to encourage others to find this treasure as from God. Many a good soldiers who would give of themselves and everything they own to see yet another cross over to this beautiful country of bounty and blessing. I know many people who would do everything they can possibly do to see others find grace and holiness. Many from days gone by and yet a few from our days as well. And thank God for them. They spend their lives and their energies trying to encourage others to find God's great blessing because we need it. We must have it. But they want them to find it God's way from little helps and little words of encouragement to great sermons that are preached but with one goal in mind, be ye holy. G. K. G. Campbell Morgan, many of people, we could quote from many of people. G. Campbell Morgan said, for instance, he had a way of answering so many questions and just so many questions that a lot of people seeking holiness have in just a few short statements. He said, holiness is not exemption from conflict, but victory to overcome conflict. Hallelujah, I know it's so. He said, holiness is not freedom from temptation, but power to overcome temptation. I know it's so. He said, holiness is not an inability to sin, but ability to not sin. He said, holiness is not the end of progress, but deliverance from standing still. C.S. Lewis said, holiness, when one meets the real thing, is absolutely irresistible, and I believe that. When you seek God and you're living for God as a Christian, God saved you and forgave you of your sins and you're seeking God walking on all the light, when God turns the light of holiness, you'll say, oh God, I want that and I want that now. Oswald Chambers said, the destined end of man is not happiness, church. It's not health, but holiness. He said, God's one end is the production of saints. He is not an eternal blessing machine for men. He did not come to save men out of pity. He came because he created man to be holy. Samuel Lucas said the essence of true holiness is conformity to the nature and the will of God. Leonard Ravenhill said the greatest miracle that God can do is to take an unholy man out of an unholy world and make that, that man holy and put him back in that unholy world and keep him holy in it. A.W. Tozer said the holy man is not one who cannot sin. A holy man is one who will not sin. Martin Luther said when God purifies the heart by faith, the market is sacred as well as the sanctuary. The outside is cleaned up. The inside is cleaned up. Both are made pure and holy. I want to touch on this. If God sanctifies your heart, you better pay close attention to the issue of outward modesty. I'm not talking necessarily about lengths either. That's part of it. But there's a whole bunch else that goes with it. When God sanctifies your heart, God wants to sanctify your wardrobe. Holiness that reaches the inside always shows up on the outside. Separate yourselves, he said, from the fellowship of the world or the world will separate you from the fellowship of God. Keeping away from the mire is better than washing it off. Attachment to Christ is the real secret to detachment from the world. Yet I wish to caution you 
There will always be more good wrought through the word of God than the words of men. I love to read. I wish I could retain like Brother, Brother Gooden know down there. I wish I could retain like he could, can. But I love to read. I'm so ignorant. I have to read a chapter and go back and read the chapter over to find out which chapter I just read. I'll read a sentence and go back and read that sentence over and read that sentence over and read that sentence over and maybe never get the rest of the paragraph done. I love to read. Not Louis L'Amour. I used to read Louis L'Amour. All of the sackets. And everything else that Louis had to offer, I read it all. I like to read other things now. From good holiness writers. But I have to tell you, never forsake the one-on-one -on -one communion with God. Being alone with Him and allowing Him to talk to you concerning your heart will do more good than all the books you can read and all the sermons that you can hear. The secret place of prayer with the Word of God open before you as a companion will do more for you in this realm of having this experience as any other thing you can possibly do. I base this on the fact of Matthew 6, 6. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut the door, pray to thy Father which is in secret. And thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee open. He will abundantly shower you with blessings beyond what you can imagine and anybody else out there can imagine when you seek him in the private place. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Can you bear with me, please? 2 Corinthians 7, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Matthew 6, 30, wherefore if God so clothed the grass of the field, which, is, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? When God clothes, as in this verse, the act properly implies the putting on of complete attire. He surrounds the being, the purpose. He, he surrounds that all on all sides like the skin of a fruit or a vegetable. He's guarding against the elements of injury. It's what God wants to do. God's holiness protects us from the outer forces. Seek it in order to save the inner man. Hebrews 12, 14, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. And he tells us, I'm almost through, please be with, bear with me. He tells us, be ye holy even as I am holy. So he not only commands it, he exemplifies it, he lived it, he taught it, he requires it. There's absolutely no risk in this statement. Don't attempt to do it man's way. Live it God's way. God reigning in your heart. Filling you with his presence. Shall we stand? Brother Quails, Sister Quails, would you come? Could you sing this song for us, please? Just for a moment before we go tonight, would you allow us just a verse or two of song? We're at camp meeting. I know some of you have a long ways to go. I know some of you are tired and weary. I know we have services tomorrow. But I want to give you a simple opportunity to come if you need holiness in your heart. What about us tonight? Do you know that God sanctifies you wholly? To be fit for the master's service, preacher or parishioner, you have to be fit for heaven. And to be fit for these, you have to be sanctified wholly. I'm not here tonight to beg you. Sorry. I've come as my duty and my desire to invite you to come and seek it. Won't you come now as they sing? One verse, please, Brother and Sister Quails. Search me, oh God, and know my heart today. Arch and be in control. Do you desire victory? Just a moment, please. Do you desire victory? over every conflict in your life. Did you hear me? Do you desire victory to overcome every conflict in your life? 
every single issue, every storm, every battle. Do you want victory to overcome every single one victoriously? He has a work called holiness for you. That'll do the job for you. Without it, you'll never be successful, dear friend. One of them will come along sometime or other and it'll take the wind out of your sails and it'll set you back. Tonight, he has a plan that we can march on till he comes to take us home, which might not be too far, very, long, very far down the road or till he comes just to take you home as an individual. I believe he has something that'll work for you, to keep you. I believe that he wants to do it. Do you want power over every temptation? Do you want to have the ability to continuous, continuously live above sin? Do you want strength to press on through all the battles? He has what it takes, and he's offering it to you now as they sing one more verse of song. The first verse, if you would, please. One more verse of song. If you're coming, come on this verse. Part now is simply this. God bless you. Would you take this with love? If you know tonight that you're walking in every ray of light and you don't have to hurry home, I know some of you do. But if, but if you don't have to, church, would you gather in with us, please, now? Would you come now, please, and help us pray with these that are here? If you know Jesus and you're walking in the light of his word, would you come now, please, if you can? Would you gather in and pray with these that are here? God knows we need a good volume of prayer. Come on quickly, if you can. If you have to go, I understand. And then if you would remember...